So two years ago, I got up here and I spoke to you as a futurist about the future opportunities in Papua New Guinea. We talked about cargo and passenger drones starting to become a thing and just a fortnight ago, we saw a Frenchman cross the English Channel on a hoverboard and we now already have drones in Papua New Guinea that are inspecting palm oil plantations. So we can see how that future is becoming the present. We talked a lot about smartphones and there are now more than four billion smartphone users globally. And in Papua New Guinea, we're heading toward a million smartphones, well over a million broadband subscribers. Those numbers will be reached probably sometime in the next year. Nearly half the country can access a 3G signal by then. We talked a lot about digital currencies and we're going to come back to that because a lot's been happening there. So the future that we started to outline two years ago is here, it's already accelerating. And the biggest of those accelerants for Papua New Guinea is one of the biggest infrastructure projects in the country's history. Now before we talk about that, you need to know something about my history. I know I get introduced a lot as a professional futurist or as an inventor or as an educator or as a broadcaster, but if you peel back all of those layers 35 years ago, I'm actually an engineer, and this is the company that I was working for 35 years ago. I'm a network engineer, and I was writing software and firmware for data communication systems back when that was a little exotic. So it's a bit of good luck because this infrastructure project that's coming to PNG, it's a network. So let's look at what the future holds, beginning with a visit to the past, to the beginning of networks. So just last month, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the manned landing on the moon. That is not the only important thing that happened 50 years ago in 1969. In September of 1969, two computers next to one another in this lab at the University of Southern California sent messages back and forth to one another over something that wasn't yet called the internet. Now, even as the internet was being invented, there wasn't really a clear idea of what they were gonna use the internet for. Okay, actually that's not really true. Someone had already figured out what we were going to do with the internet and they'd done it actually before the internet existed. A guy named Douglas Engelbart, it's him up there. Now, you probably won't have heard his name before today, but I assure you that every time that you use the web or you poke at a link on your screen or you edit using a keyboard and a mouse or you do any of that over the internet, what you're doing is you're using technology that Engelbart invented over 50 years ago. He knew the internet was coming because he had been set up to be one of the centers for this internet and he built a prototype of the World Wide Web to take advantage of the internet because Engelbart knew that it, and a network by itself, not very useful. It's what people can do on the network. That's where the value of a network lies. And Engelbart wanted to build networks that would help make people smarter. He wanted to give people access to more information, to better information, make it easy to share that information and find that information quickly. So that's very much the world that we live in today. And what we've learned, as we've learned how to make the most of our networks, what we've learned can provide a guide for Papua New Guinea through to 2050, which is about a billion seconds from now. Now there's a term that you might have heard, particularly if you're in technology or you've dealt with technology vendors. The term is network stack. It gets thrown around. The term gets used, almost never gets explained. It's an incredibly powerful idea, not just for how to use technology, but for how to build businesses. And whole sectors of the economy of 2019 have actually been organized around the idea of a network stack. 
The best way to think of a network stack, and this is the network stack, is that it's a value chain. It's organized vertically rather than horizontally. It's kind of like a multi-story building. Every layer in the stack is providing value. It's adding value to the layers above it. There are seven layers in the network stack, and so there are seven distinct areas where innovators and businesses can add value or plug their value-add products into the stack. Now, at the bottom of the stack, this is the foundation upon which everything else rests. We call that the physical layer. And at that part of the network, we don't even think about digital bits. There are no ones and zeros. The physical layer is all about transmitting and receiving signals. So the physical layer, that's the light that's coming through an optical fiber cable. But it's not the data in that light. And I know that sounds like a very subtle distinction until you realize that there's more than one way to get a signal from a transmitter to a receiver. A fiber optic cable is a fantastic way to transmit signals. It's very fast, it's reasonably cheap, tends to last a lot longer than electrical cables, they don't degrade. And Papua New Guinea is in the incredible position of having two fiber optic cable services brought into the country. There's the International Coral Sea Cable, which I believe connects Sydney, Port Moresby, and then Hong Kong, right? Ha oh, sorry, Haniara. And then there's the Kumo Submarine Domestic Fiber Cable, which is mapped out here, which brings all of the connectivity around PNG. Now, fiber optic cables work really well when they're strung out across the bottom of the sea. They actually get very expensive when you have to lay them on land, which is one reason why Australia's national broadband network doesn't have fiber everywhere. And it's extremely expensive when the layout of the land is irregular, as it often is in Papua New Guinea. The costs make it rapidly uneconomic. And this is why a network engineer separates the idea of a signal, the physical layer, from the bits which are handled the next layer up in what they call the data link layer. Because there's more than one way to transmit a signal. So fiber optics work really well across the coral sea. But to get a signal from the lowlands to the highlands, something else might work better, such as, say, radio waves. And radio waves you can transmit in many different ways. You can do this with ground towers, as we do with mobiles. Mobile tower doesn't really give you a lot of coverage. Even a fairly tall tower, if you're lucky, will give you 50 square kilometers of coverage. And again, that's on flat surfaces. And Papua New Guinea has 450,000 square kilometers of land, which is uneven. So it's going to need a lot of towers. And would still need something like fiber optic cables to connect all of those towers together inside of a network. That's difficult, it's expensive. But there are alternatives. There are other kinds of physical layers that use radio waves. You might be familiar with geostationary satellites. So these sit up over the equator, point down, and follow a point on the Earth's surface. And they're 40,000 kilometers up in orbit. Now, Papua New Guinea is in an unusually good position for geostationary satellites because it's located so close to the equator. But 40,000 kilometers is a long way to send a signal. A radio wave moves at the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second. So it takes over a quarter of a second to get a signal out to a geostationary satellite and then back down to Earth. A quarter of a second doesn't sound like a lot, if you're a computer, that's an eternity. And if you can think about trying to do a phone call with someone and everyone being delayed by a quarter of a second, you yourself would go a bit bananas. So geostationary satellites, they're expensive to launch, they're expensive to maintain, to connect to them requires expensive dedicated equipment. That could be an ideal solution for a miner. It's not going to be a good solution for a farmer. You're going to need a different kind of physical layer. And this is where three new technologies are coming into play. Now, the first of these is called Starlink. 
Starlink is a spin-off of SpaceX. SpaceX is the new space company that was founded by Elon Musk several years ago. Starlink has already launched the first 60 of what will be 12,000 satellites that are about the size of a refrigerator. They're in low Earth orbit, so they're around 550 kilometers rather than 40,000 kilometers. And that means that the time it takes a signal to get to satellite and back down to Earth again is actually about the same as it would if it were traveling over the ground. So it's about 10 times quicker. Now, we won't see all of these satellites in orbit for about another two or three years. The network's going to begin operations next year. It is expected to be a lot less expensive than the geostationary satellites, although you're still going to need a base station, and the base station is going to be expensive. So does that mean it's going to be cheap enough for a price-sensitive Papua New Guinea farmer? Well, Starlink is not going to have space to themselves. Blue Origin, which is a company that was founded by Jeff Bezos, they're going to be launching the sites of a Canadian company called Telesat. And they're promising extremely low cost, high quality mobile broadband speeds. They're actually saying fiber optic speeds from orbit. So there is going to be a lot of competition coming up among these satellite based providers but it costs at least $10 billion to get enough satellites in orbit to give the kind of coverage you need to be able to offer these services. So that may mean that the return on investment in these services will keep the prices high for a period of time. All right, but do we really even need to send rockets into orbit? Do we need to have satellites covering the Earth? Why wouldn't we just use balloons? So. Balloons won't leave the atmosphere, that's a good thing. And the closer they are to Earth, the easier it is to get the signal up and back down. And this is the theory behind Google's Project Loon. So Project Loon is a spin-off of Alphabet, which is the holding company that owns Google. It has been specifically designed to meet the communications needs of the corners of the world that are difficult to reach with other kinds of physical layers. They have designed a purpose-built vehicle, the type of balloon that sits in the stratosphere. So it's above clouds, it's above storms, and it will sit there for weeks or months with a platform in it that is solar charged and it's always in sunshine during the daytime hours. And it's relatively easy to keep something in one place in the stratosphere. Once it's there, that communications platform becomes a signal router. So that's relatively cheap, it's relatively fast, it's in its early stages of testing, it's being tested in Kenya and a couple of other places in Africa. It seems to work relatively well. Now the drawback here is that it requires a base station and that base station isn't cheap. But that's the only expensive element in Project Luna. You can see it's not a bad idea. But there may even be a cheaper solution, because why would you need a base station at all? What if you could use something that's a hybrid of all of these? And there's a new startup that's testing a solution. They're called Ubiquity Link. So they want to be able to put satellites up in low orbit, very low orbit, that will allow mobiles to connect directly using 4G LTE. So rather than going to a mobile tower, the signal from your mobile will go directly to orbit. If that works, and if it's cheap enough, and they're testing this right now, then Ubiquilink could provide a physical layer connection for the hardest to reach areas in PNG. So what you have now is a set of different techniques. You have fiber optics, you have geostationary satellites, you have low Earth satellites, you have stratospheric balloons, and you have direct to satellite LTE. Each of these provide physical layer connections to businesses, to individuals. Each are driven by specific needs, location, price sensitivity, and the mix in Papua New Guinea is likely going to be more varied and more interesting than almost anywhere else in the world. 
So that's the physical layer. The physical layer is a patchwork of different kinds of signal technologies. Some are optical, some will be electrical, some will be radio, and as a result, the investment opportunities in Papua New Guinea will be varied. There are going to be many different technologies using the physical layer to bring whole coverage to the whole nation. And it won't be cheap, but neither is it going to be ruinously expensive. And although the telecoms carriers resist the idea of being thought of as utilities, utilities offer guaranteed long-term returns, which is a good thing to fall back on in a sluggish growth 21st century. Okay, so getting connected is actually the hardest part of all of this. Everything after that is comparatively easy. And we've now reached the next layers in our little protocol stack. So there's three more layers, the data link layer, the network layer, and the transport layer. The data link layer turns the signals into bits. The network layer gets the bits from point A to point B, and the transport layer ensures that the bits you send off at point A are the bits you receive at point B. So that's beginning to look like a network that you might recognize, like the networks that we use. Okay, so what do, once you have a network, well, what do you do with a network? Well, once you have a network, the first thing you do is you sell your network to customers. And every one of the physical layers, whether it's coming from a satellite or it's coming from a fiber optic, all of them are going to have their own customers. All of them will need data links, they'll need networks, they'll need transport layers. Those services are invisible. You've never thought about any of this when you open up and get on the internet. It's all taken care of. They're taken for granted, but they're always present, which means there's always someone providing those surface services. So let's focus on the fiber optic connection because that's the lowest cost and the highest speed of all the physical layers. Wherever the fiber lands, and that's true for both the international and the domestic cables, wherever the fiber lands, it will help commerce flourish. Connectivity is like the oxygen of the 21st century. So everything that's close to that sort of connectivity can be had easily and expensively in a benefit to that location. In other words, what I'm saying is that the value of real estate increases in proportion to its proximity to these connections. The closer the real estate is to a connection, the more valuable that real estate is. And there are things that you can do in proximity to a connection that you can't do easily further away. The first thing that you can do is you can sell that connectivity as an ISP, and there has been a dramatic growth in the numbers of ISPs in Papua New Guinea precisely because these connections are coming in. So they're coming in where the connections are coming in, they're adding the data, network, and transport layers, and they're turning the proximity to the physical connection into value. And that's an old story. When I moved to Los Angeles in 1996, my ISP, I think don't exist anymore, LA Bridge, they were located in a building called MAE West, May West, it's a bit of a pun, that building is, was the exchange, in other words, the physical connection point for all internet traffic on the west coast of the United States. It all came into that building. And so LA Bridge's offices were just two floors underneath. And so they just ran a cable from upstairs to downstairs and it was very easy and cheap for them to have a high quality connection that they could then resell to customers like me. And that is just as true today. ISPs sell connectivity to businesses, they add value to their connectivity, they add value at the data link, the network and the transport levels, and then their customers add value at the layers above that, the application layers. And we're all really comfortable these days with all sorts of business apps that are delivered over the network, whether you're using email, whether you're doing some stuff with documents, whether you're messaging, whether you're using banking and finance apps. This is how all of us do business today. So among the most obvious customers for ISPs are cloud computing data centers that provide the infrastructure for all of these business apps. 
And it's no overstatement to say that 21st century business is mobile first and it's cloud first. And to do both of those well, you need to have great connectivity. And that means that the co-location of computing resources happens near the ISP, near the fiber optic connection. ISPs don't take up a lot of space. Cloud computing data centers can span hectares. And that's why this real estate is suddenly so valuable. And data centers are power hungry. I mean, I think somewhere around three and a half percent of all of the electricity generated on planet Earth right now is consumed by data centers. And data centers are particularly power hungry in warm climates because computers need to be kept cool. So there's going to be a growing demand for a highly reliable supply of electricity for these data centers. And so in this way, physical layer connectivity via the fiber optic cable actually fosters a virtuous cycle of economic relationships just by its presence. Because physical layer connectivity leads to ISPs on selling network services, which leads to computing and utility infrastructure needed to provision cloud-based services and apps that use those services. And that's already a whole bunch of new business and a whole bunch of new economic opportunities for PNG. And there's already demand for these. Most of the medium or larger businesses in Papua New Guinea would already be using cloud computing applications that are currently located offshore. Having them closer means they'll be more responsive and they'll be more reliable. And it's very likely that the big three, which is Amazon and Microsoft and Google, will want to locate their own cloud data centers in Papua New Guinea. Each of them already has a lot of data traffic there, and it will make sense for them to offer those services locally. And you're going to see smaller cloud providers likely to provision space in data centers. And all of that's really good news, because cloud computing is the foundation of the app economy. And the app economy is something that already almost a million Papua New Guineans participate in via their smartphones. So once there's cloud computing infrastructure, businesses will have the capacity to deliver cloud-first services specifically tailored to the needs of Papua New Guinea. And now that we've gotten through the bottom half of the stack, those first four layers, we can take a look at how a world of cloud-first applications can be built for PNG by PNG. Okay. So the government of Papua New Guinea has made it clear that it wants to enrich the country by unleashing its agricultural potential. So how can this new connectivity and app economy amplify that potential? Well, one way to do it, one obvious way to do it, is by sharing and amplifying human capacities with one another across local communities. Allowing communities to learn from one another and then put what they learn to work. So how can what someone's learned over there be useful to someone over there? How can we learn from one another at a scale that transcends the historical horizons of villages and communities? How can a nation learn at national scale? And whether it's Papua New Guinea or Australia or Silicon Valley, we're all agreed that the way forward is to work smarter. And the way we get smarter is by learning. And the way we learn is by sharing our experiences with one another. We take our years of experience, we make them available to others who may be answering the very questions that we're asking, or maybe asking the very questions that we've answered. So everyone with a smartphone and a signal can be informed by everything everyone in Papua New Guinea has done who has a smartphone and a signal and a desire to share. That's the shape of Wikipedia. Wikipedia is the most successful knowledge sharing project in human history. It's the gold standard. Now, Wikipedia is about general knowledge. 
but it is possible to create specific, deep forms of knowledge sharing on any subject, such as agriculture in Papua New Guinea. And it's not expensive. It doesn't cost a lot in bandwidth or in computer resources, perhaps a few hundred dollars a month. But it does require human capital. I was told by Jimmy Wales, who's the founder of Wikipedia, that for any wiki project to succeed, you need to have five people who are dedicated to that success. And they will work toward that end for as long as it takes until they are successful. By the time it's successful, those five individuals will have fostered a common tool for the over 80% of people in Papua New Guinea who farm and who will continue to farm. It's something that can help them every single day. And so that's the kind of project that some bright sparks in Papua New Guinea would consider championing. But that's only the beginning of what's possible. Agriculture is about the land. To understand the land means mastery of at least two things, maps and title. Now, Google and Apple have both gone some way to mapping the entire world. But the world that they've mapped is shaped by their view of the world. It's all about users and data and analytics and targeting, which is very far from the world of a Papua New Guinea farmer. So the internet giants are going to largely overlook maps in Papua New Guinea, at least in the form that would be most useful to farmers because there's no value to them in it. But there is enormous value in good maps to those farmers. Maps show the terrain. They can reveal in depth the details of the land itself, soil quality, cropage, rainfall, watersheds, irrigation, on and on and on. There's a lot to know about the land. And there's a real reason to have a map that holds all of that knowledge. It allows us to assess, it allows us to monitor, allows us to preserve, and we're needed to protect the valuable resources that are part of the land. There's an amazing project that's been underway, I think for the last decade, that can be very helpful with this. It's called OpenStreetMap. So unlike the privatized maps of Apple and Google, OpenStreetMap is created by open contributions. It's created by everyone for the use of everyone. The data is always freely available. And so what's happened is emergency and government services in a range of developing countries that haven't been served by Apple and Google have found OpenStreetMap absolutely vital because it offers detail that they cannot get elsewhere. And so Papua New Guinea could take OpenStreetMap and add to it. Here's lay right now on OpenStreetMap. They can adapt to it as needed. They can populate it with all of the information that's important to a thriving agricultural nation. Making that map as complete and comprehensive as possible can become a common project, a national project for Papua New Guinea. Mapping the nation for the good of the nation. It's not hard to do. People know the land. All they have to do is share what they know into the map. And farmers, farmers will be able to look at the map, the map that they helped to create and learn from it, learn what others have shared about what they do and where they do it and how they do it. The nation as a whole can be teaching itself about its land and about its agriculture. But then there's something else. There's something that sits with that map sits beside that map, title. Who owns the land? Who has rights to land? Who has rights to the resources on that land? That's always been a very fraught topic. Title goes all the way back to the origins of civilization, and title is one of the foundations of common law. And informal systems of title, <coughs> can be used by the powerful to exploit the weak. Even formal systems of title can be abused, although it's much harder to do that. Now, in the last few years, we've seen title registration systems that are based on a technology known as the distributed ledger. It's a way of facilitating trust between parties who have no natural reason to trust one another. And so distributed ledgers, they provide a mechanism 
to prove title without having to head to court every time. And that means they can provide the protections of title law to people who often can't afford to defend those rights in court. And it's still very early days for these systems. But there have been proof of concepts in India, in this is in Georgia, in Guatemala. But think of title as another way of looking at the map. It's another aspect of the map. The map and title systems are two views into the same essential information about the land. And you can see that it might be a really good idea to grow both of those systems together as apps on the PNG cloud. Land maps and title maps could easily be the first kind of apps to sit on a PNG cloud, running in a PNG data center, using a PNG ISP, connected via the Coral Sea and Coral Fiber optic cables. And this is where I hope you can see the network stack. This is the potential. Now, Papua New Guinea doesn't need to have an internet that looks like Indonesia's, where it's basically 100% Facebook. It doesn't need to have an internet like India's, where WhatsApp is being used to seed and stir social unrest. Papua New Guinea can have its own internet with apps that serve its own needs. And yes, there will be Facebooks and Googles and all the rest, but they should rightly sit alongside and serve the immediate and important needs of Papua New Guinea. And this is the key point. People will use these tools, these new apps, because they help them be the best that they can be. Right now, the average revenue per mobile user in Papua New Guinea is very low, mostly because the mobile hasn't been thought of as a tool that can help people generate more income. And as soon as those tools exist for the mobile, they're going to be taken up because we've already seen that in India. We've already seen that in Kenya. We've seen this over and over again in all of the developing world. The mobile becomes a central tool for economic empowerment. And for that reason, these sorts of services designed by Papua New Guineans for Papua New Guineans, they can aid in that empowerment. They can help people to become wealthier. They can generate more demand for bandwidth and better cloud apps. And so they create a virtuous cycle of capacity building and economic growth. And these are just a few examples of what's possible. Think about the enormous advances that have been made in logistics. Uber, for all that it's a very problematic organization, completely revolutionized the way we think of logistics. If logistics are a big issue in PNG, then we need to start to think about building a cloud app infrastructure to help remove all of the barriers to logistics, help things flow around the country, help products get in and out. Trading, how do people trade? How can we build apps and app platforms that allow people to trade seamlessly and quickly? Employment whether that's casual or short form or long form employment, all of these can and should be sitting as apps on a Papua New Guinea cloud. These are the kinds of tools that augment human capacity and well-being. And that was Doug Engelbart's original intention for the internet 50 years ago. And it's Papua New Guinea's turn now. The torch is being passed. So building an internet that serves Papua New Guinea, helps Papua New Guinea grow, that is a problem worth solving in the years to 2050. And let's be clear, these are not moonshot projects. They will not cost billions of dollars. They won't take decades to complete. These apps, these services, most of these, if begun today, yield benefits in months, and they bring benefits to the whole nation. Okay, before I conclude, I want to circle back to something that I, I spoke about when I talked two years ago. 
digital currencies. So we have this growing disconnect between smartphones and the cash economy. It is growing particularly acute now because in the developed world, yeah, sure, everyone's walking around with credit cards and bank accounts, and that makes mobile commerce easily possible. But developing countries, well, they do have mobile money services and they use text messaging to transfer payments and remittances. It's a good thing. It's not enough. And as smartphones offer more and more sophisticated services, the gap between what we're doing and what's possible is growing wider and wider. Now there are efforts underway to close this gap, to bring money to the smartphone. Two months ago, Facebook announced their own solution to this called Libra. It's a digital currency that can be used on smartphones. It can be traded between individuals. It can be used as a payments platform by SMEs. It's backed by 28 of the world's biggest organizations, MasterCard, Visa, Uber, Vodafone. Libra is for anyone who wants to trade anywhere in the world. Its value is pegged against a basket of currencies, including US dollars and US Treasury notes. So it's a stable, secure currency. And Facebook has gotten enormous pushback, particularly from central bankers in the US and in the EU, because they see this as a fundamental threat to their own control over their own monetary policy. And there's something to this. But there's another argument. There's an argument that when digital payments can move frictionlessly from one smartphone to another smartphone, economies have more to gain than they stand to lose. And wherever you stand on this, and there are good arguments to be made either way, everything that was theoretical, that seemed five or 10 years away in my keynote two years ago, it has suddenly become very real. Should you let Facebook control your money supply? I mean, even if you reject that proposal out of hand, that was only the first of what is now an increasing supply of well-resourced and commercially promoted digital currencies, including two weeks ago, one from the People's Bank of China. So two weeks ago, the People's Bank of China took the wraps off their own five-year project to create a digital yuan. And they want to launch it in a limited way sometime over the next year. We can expect that this will come to dominate payments in China over the next decade. Already the Chinese have the most sophisticated digital payments system in the world. The trade and security wars that are currently raging between the US and China, they're going to take on a whole new dimension. Because the move to digital currencies is going to see each power, and many other powers, offering their own digital currencies as solutions for central bankers in developing economies as a quick, easy way to accelerate economic growth. And Last night, Binance, which is the largest cryptocurrency exchange in the world, they announced that they're uh, launching their own digital currency called Venus, just in the last 24 hours. So we can see there's a whole race on to get these digital currencies out. People will be coming to you, offering the digital currencies, offering you all of the benefits of these digital currencies. So this is happening. This is no longer theoretical. The currency wars have begun, and the next 10 years are going to see them raging. And so the world of the 2020s is one, not only where Papua New Guinea is well connected, but because it is well connected, it's also going to be cashed up with digital currencies. And that will transform Papua New Guinea as much as, if not more than, any cable connection. And so it will make sense to think this through very carefully, to strategize, to plan, to experiment, so that as the digital currencies arrive, they serve Papua New Guinea, not just the makers of these currencies, not just the Facebooks and the People's Bank of China or whoever, because this future is here and it's right now.
The future is here, and it's accelerating with every link of the Kumu and the Coral Sea cables. Papua New Guinea now has the connections. Use those connections to share, to learn, and then use what you're learning from one another to transform Papua New Guinea. Thank you.